<laughs> so, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our final plenary. A welcome from me. Welcome. Fantastic. From me. <laughs> so, we still have boundless energy on the stage. If you've traveled halfway around the world to be with us, you will be feeling uh, perhaps a little bit jaded, but we are going to go on a further journey uh, to see countries at different stages of development and how they are embracing the circular economy. And I think this is promises to, to show us some interesting uh, thoughts and ideas. Yeah, uh, you know, in, we know that every country has a specific on different problem, but uh, now I'd like to personally uh, draw your attention to the country, especially where the population is growing and the economy growing. I think they have uh, uh, quite, a, you know, the imminent uh, you know, problem, uh, you know, throughout the, the circular economy. So mm. I think we have uh, excellent, mm. uh, you know, the speaker and panelists here. And we're going to be looking at different examples, and then towards the end, we're going to be drawing some strands together and uh, seeing maybe what some of the key messages uh, for those of us who are reaching out mm. and, and connecting with concepts, thoughts, and actions on circularity. So where should we start the journey? Yeah, so the, now I'd like to invite uh, uh, Mr. Hide Toshi Nishimura from the area. Do you know that area is an economic research institute for ASEAN and East Asia? He is the president. I think that he is going to present something, supplies here to the audience. So you have the floor. Thank yes. you. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'd like to make a presentation about the benefit, good practices, and the challenges of circular economy in ASEAN. ARIA is an international organization, originally East Asian OECD. We have the MOU with OECD, and we are the Sherpa organization to support the East Asia Summit and uh, ASEAN Summit. And mainly, we are involved with ASEAN economic community and ASEAN social cultural community, ASCC. So I'd like to start my presentation. The next, please. Okay. Oh, I, I, I use this one? Next, this one. All right, thank you. The circular economy presents a fundamental and necessary alternatives to the linear take, make, consume, dispose economy model, linear model, that currently predominates industrial production systems in ASEAN and East Asia. There are various elements toward creating circular economy, such as improved resource efficiency in production, redesign product for recycling and remanufacturing, source separation program, sharing, recycling, and so forth. There are a number of technical, economical, social benefits could be envisaged, and regulatory factors are required to effect the transition to circular economy. The main benefits as well as drivers will differ depending on types of material systems of the countries. For example, Metals can be recycled and water used in processing them can be recycled to this end. Enabling factors such as business models should be defined. While the list of driving factors is not limited to ASEAN countries, wide range of changes are necessary to trigger or advance the transition. The transition to circular economy will create economic co-benefits, such as enhanced material productivity and environmental co-benefits, such as waste to energy. These waste to energy initiatives at the city level will reduce further material extraction 
as well as carbon emissions, a circular economy that provides opportunities to create well-being, growth, and jobs while reducing environmental pressures for ASEAN countries. The concept of a circular economy has recently gained traction in ASEAN policy making as a positive and solution-based perspective for economic development overcoming resource constraints. The circular economy focus on restorative and regenerative models. In essence, it represents a fundamental alternative to the ivory set, linear take, make, consume, dispose economic model that currently predominates ASEAN economies. Eco design, repair, reuse, refurbishment, remanufacturing, waste prevention, and waste recycling are all important in circular economy. This figure shows a simplified model. The main idea is that waste generation and material inputs are minimized through eco design, recycling, and reuse of products. This table shows the economic benefit of collecting used paper. Collection of used paper generates more than 1 billion US dollars in Southeast Asia. Recycling of used paper also contributes to save natural forests. Some of unemployed people get income from picking recyclable waste at curbside or landfill site. The ratio of waste pickers and waste buyers moving around the street are estimated from 0.06% to 0.79% in some cities in Southeast Asia. In order to achieve necessary system changes, however, we need to find the synergic economic and social incentives. Application of 3R, reduce, recycle, and reuse approach, encourage consumers and producers to think about the benefit of circular economy. 3R is enabled by business model of innovation, such as waste to energy conversion, the relevance of reuse repair has recently grown in countries like Singapore, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. Cambodia and Laos are also exploring proactive 3R policies. There are other policy initiatives towards the circular economy in Southeast Asia. Manufacturers and retailers have conducted some recycling programs voluntarily. Fuji Xerox has conducted recycling programs since December 2004 and already achieved 99.8% recovery rate. In 2007, government, industry sectors, and NGOs in Singapore made a packaging agreement which encourages voluntary action to reduce waste. Extended producer responsibility is also going to be applied in Southeast Asian country. Green public procurement program, program has been implemented by government of Singapore and Thailand. Some NGOs are active to produce products from packaging waste. Some of them are exporting such products through fair trade system. Remanufacturing needs quality assurance. Some companies making retreaded tire have equipment to check their inner condition. From now on, area made the best effort to complete our research. This is a book last week to contribute to today's symposium. From now, I'd like to highlight some important concepts and findings 
based on this book, Industry 4.0, Empowering ASEAN for Circular Economy. A new set of diverse and complex set of technologies are crucial for promoting transition to circular economy from farm level to higher sectoral level, higher level. These technologies range from Internet of Things, 3D printing, to artificial intelligence and machine-to-machine -machine computing, deep learning, as you know, GAN, GAN, Generative Adversary Network. Raw material extraction, processing, and production companies can use Industry 4.0 technologies more efficiently the same technology can be used for more efficient resource management and turning waste into new raw materials. As such, the material cycle could be closed. Integration of Industry 4.0 into circular economy. This is a new idea, integration, Industry 4.0 and the circular economy requires closer cooperation among research, technological, and business communities, and the creation of innovation space at firm level. Southeast Asia has relatively greater innovative efficiency than the rest of developing countries. That so this is a better case. It is efficient in converting R&D inputs into high-tech export, but they lag behind in level of innovation inputs. Innovation, R&D is decreasing, but the high-tech export is increasing. The figures show the results of 2009 to 2013 technology competitiveness survey in Vietnam. About 7,000 companies in Vietnam are surveyed on investing research and adaptation of technologies. While 7% of firms pursue either R&D or adaptation, only 3% of firms operate both R&D and adaptation to innovate their production chain. More efforts are needed on innovation front. At the present, there is no recognized way of measuring, measuring readiness of a country or ASEAN as a group in their endeavor of transition. This table shows an assessment framework across multiple policy domains. Readiness of circular economy can be enhanced five elements. One, higher education. Number two, new market creation. Number three, labor market. Number four, technology adaptation. And the final number five, financial intermediaries, intermediaries, financial intermediaries. Without an integrated policy framework, many serial business in ASEAN will not be able to compete with existing linear economies and could lose their advantage. As of now, Singapore ranks high. You can find that here in readiness for circular economy transition, followed by Malaysia and Thailand. Because of the complex dynamics in governing the transition, the readiness framework needs to be flexible, allowing the adaptation of indicators and to focus areas maintaining its effectiveness. To move into compete and survive in circular economy. ASEAN countries need to do more. 
This readiness framework was developed for assessing the industry 4.0 readiness for circular economy based on manufacturing output data and high technology exports. This mapping shows that ASEAN countries could be grouped into four clusters. First, Singapore and Malaysia are the potential innovators for Industry 4.0 with their high technology export profile. Second, Indonesia, the Philippines, and Thailand as efficiency seeker through Industry 4.0. Third, the Vietnam as mid-term Industry 4.0 transitionary due to its lower Industry 4.0 readiness. Finally, Cambodia, Lao, PDR, Myanmar as slow movers towards Industry 4.0. To promote Industry 4.0 within circular economy in ASEAN, specific strengths and weakness of cluster countries must be recognized. One size fits all re approach should not be adopted. Nevertheless, each cluster country could progressively move in a step of the way for integrating Industry 4.0 for circular economy. First step, strengthening production and maintenance capabilities and supply chain management. Second, partnering in production and incremental innovation. Third, architectural and modular innovation. Fourth, assuming industry 4.0 leadership. We should examine modalities for implementing cooperation mechanism. Major policy changes are needed at business, local, national, and international levels. International exchange of expertise is crucial. In summary, I would like to reiterate the following points. With rapid economic growth, Resource consumption has been greatly increasing in ASEAN. Waste reduction through circular economy concept is crucial for the future of industries. Current methods to integrate the concepts of Industry 4.0 and the circular economy have business values, but more comprehensive measurement and monitoring framework is necessary. The existing 3R appro uh, approaches are effective entry points, but innovations in technical and financial models are needed. More market scenarios are required to waste energy projects, e-waste streams, and sharing economy. I'm confident that this second World Circular Economy Forum will help the countries and stakeholders to forge knowledge partnerships and unleash unleash new wave of ideas of addressing challenges. Earlier, that is uh, our latest uh, the publication, and the last one is really this book, 500 pages. You can download free from area website. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. Thank you. So you will not be signing copies of the book in the lobby. But clearly, it's great to have a strong evidence base. Uh, and it looks as though that's some very interesting uh, information, well researched, that will offer us some clear sense of direction and priorities and key issues emerging. This morning, we talked about uh, circular, circularity, the challenge of doing things at pace and at scale. Our next case study comes from China. And to hear about how China is embracing circularity uh, within its development process, delighted to welcome uh, the, to the platform the Director for the Division of Circular Economy Development, Department of Resource Conservation and Environmental Protection of National Development and Reform Commission of China. That was a long breath. Delighted to welcome to the platform Mr. Lu Dongsen. Uh, 
这个女士们、先生们，这个非常荣幸，这个呃，由我在这个大会啊，介绍一下中国的循环经济的情况，还有我们在使循环经济理念落实过程中的一些体会。那么这个呃，大家知道，这个在世界范围内啊，循环经济这个很多是脱胎于废物管理。但呢，在中国呢，这个资源再生环节尽管是一个重要的环节，它伤害更多的这个我们体现在整个资源利用的全过程。从某种意义上来说，它是一个资源利用的整体的一个资源利用战略。比如说这个减量化，我们是通过有效的组织生产过程中的资源利用的方式。和形态来减量化，这是在生产过程，在消费过程，我们是倡导绿色消费的理念去实行减量化，而不仅仅是这个污染排放的减量化。所以呢，是我们是循环经济是贯穿于整个利用的整体战略和整个资源流动的全过程。呃，这个，那么。呃，从我们中国来看呢，这个循环经济啊，这个发展经历了几个阶段，在这个我们的这个十五阶段，呃，它是我们从呃，像这个啊、呃，日方啊、欧盟啊等等先进国家，我们学习引入了循环经济的理念，但是这个理念怎么转化转化为政策现实，我们需要做很多工作。那么循环经济，我们理解，首先要能循环，能循环就首先要这个要有技术的突破，要有技技术来支撑突破。同时，这种循环又要有经济，就是不能光循环不经济，所以既循环又经济，那么循环经济就需要商业模式的支撑。那么，只有当技术路线成型。商业模式清晰了以后，那么我们要探讨把这个转为一层制度的和政策的环境。所以呢，我们呢大多数的工作啊，就围绕着这一个来开展。那么十五期间，我们实行了理念的引进；十一五期间，我们进行了小范围的试点，主要讲究解决两个问题：一，靠什么技术；第二个，在什么政策条件。和制度条件下，它能产生支撑循环经济运作的商业模式。因为在整体的政策和制度环境调整是困难的，那么我在试点上面上小范围的率先突破。那么第三个就是“十二五”期间，把“十一五”期间经过实践检验有效的制度做法，我们。凝聚成重大的工程，进一步扩大它的范围。在这个过程中，我们判断它的投资价值，判断它所需的制度环境。那么现在是处于“十三五”期间，我们经过三个五年计划的不断的试点探索、实践总结，我们现在处于制度形成阶段。<咳>那么“十一五”期间，我们在。呃，几个方面进行了试点，一个是这个在区域和行业方面，我们这个选了若干个省、市、县、三级进行了试点。那么在行业上，我们选择了十个行业进行了试点。同时呢，在生产的有效组织方面呢，我们选择了园区十三个试试点园区，这是“十一五”的情况。那么，在这个过程中，我们找到了技术模模式，找到了方法学，找到了在常规政策制度环境下它不能产生的模式，需要新的这个制度，怎么新的制度供给，都是通过“十一五”期间我们的试点项目。我们也在这个过程中也看到了它落地过程中的问题和困难。那么“十二五”期间，我们实现了就是进一步。对有效的部分进一步的总结和扩大，那么我们这个搞了一百个园区的循环化改造，
我们建立了四十九个这个存矿的基地，我们总结了具体的可推广、有商业、有可持续商业模式支撑的这个技术，那么这进行托管。我们在这几个方面啊，都进行了试点。那么对它适宜工程化实施，啊，适宜这个。整体推进的，我们现在是在总结。总结呢，我们这个对经过实践检验啊，有这个商业生命力的，我们在这个技术可行、商业模式可行的条件下，形成我们的技术管理规范。所以呢，我们“十三五”呢，在这个试点示范的同时呢，我们在总结，形成我们的目前呢，已经形成了。啊、呃，这么一些总的，有循环经济法来做统领，分项领域呢，有这个具体的管理办法。那么下呃，其他领域呢，还在不断的扩展之中。那么回顾我们这个呃，我们中国的循环经济发展呢，我是想的这个呃几个方面，有几条主线，因为工作啊很多，它围绕着几个主线。一个是这个围绕着资源利用的环节，那么是生产，就怎么有效的进行资源开采、资源生生产，有效的引导公众的历史消费，有效的进行再生、资源再生环节。那么这一个它是有一条主线，那么在开采环节就要有这个这个绿色开采。那么这一块呢，在我们国家是由呃国土部负责。呃，现在的自然资源，呃，自然资源生态部，当然发改委负责这个总体的制度设计。那么在生产过程，企业层面是要抓好清洁生产，园区层面要搞好园区内部企业之间的产业的互相的连接。从这个要对园区啊，首先需要做物质流分析，看看一个园区的资源流进去。哪些变成了产品？哪些变成了低价值的中间产品？哪些是变成了废物？我们基于物质流分析，我们再看我现在的产业基础，我们需要调整、引进哪些这个产业或者项目？哪些要调整出去、压减掉？哪些这个属于低价值的中间产品、高价值化？那么？这样使我们的形成了一个产业的生态集群，从而提高整体产业的。sorry， 回去了，啊，时间到了，等会儿。啊，呀，那么另外一个就是我们的城镇化，这是我们也是一项重要任务。那么这里面包括历史交通啊，历史消费，交通我们大家知道我们的呃滴滴啊，我们的摩拜等等。就是说，有资源的利用方，由产品的占有变成享有产品的服务，那么这样的大规模的提供，提高资源的利用效率。那么，城矿和这个资源循环利用基地，主要是解决城市和城市群可持续发展中遇到的问题。那么，以前我们仓储垃圾、建筑垃圾都是单品处理，单品处理的问题很大，一浪费很多土土地。第二个，各种不同的城市低质污染物的利用过程中的协同机会减少了，所以呢，我们要把它元气化、集聚化、协同化。这个呢，我们也正在做这个大量的一个工作。同时呢，一厂一厂，我们原来农林废弃物和农农工铝，就是农农业和工业，就是农产品的深加工和农业旅游，怎么有效的结合？形成新的一个产业共同体，也是我们循环经济现在在考虑的一个方面。这是两个主线，那么当然了，这个呃，我们取得了呃，基于这个主线啊，取得了一些这个成绩。那么这个成绩呢，呃，我们这因为时间限制，我们就简单说一下，主要是产业体系呃，促进了经济的转型，有呃，这个资源产出力，还有环境效益指标啊，都明显的提高。同时呢，我们在这个实践中呢，也获得了很多制度设计定型化的一个
这个体会。所以呢，我们近期呢，进一步扩大的就是园区，因为在中国，百分之六十的 GDP 在园区产生，百分之八十五的 GDP 在，呃，工业增加值在园区。我们已有的分散布局的工业企业，也要向园区集中。所以抓好了园区，就抓好了。这个工业整个是就是动脉端的这个循环。第二个就是刚才我说的这个资源呃循环利用基地，主要就是解决城镇化过程中的一些问题。那么除了这些呢，我们其他的基地实践呢也在进行制度设计和推动中，主要是 EPR 制度。由于时间限制，谢谢啊。Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the Mr. Don Sen for the, his excellent speech. Uh, I, we know now that the, how did China, you know, they deploy this concept of circular economy uh, by making use of model project at a different level and even in the businesses. So then I, I think that we could uh, listen to another example uh, this time that I'd like to invite the, uh, Mr. Luke Gunakaja. Uh, he is, is presenting the case of Benan. So the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Well, I, give, I bring you greetings from Benin. And Benin is the best spot of Africa. And I think everyone from Africa will agree with me. <laughs> yes, uh, not only because it's the only map, in the map of the country in the world which looks like a key. So, but in Benin, the economy like in many African countries is an economy whereby people are quite used to reuse and recycle. And some people have been saying that in that regard, uh, African economies are rather closer to secularity than many developed countries. Well, let us be specific. Uh, reusing and recycling is not enough to be, uh, you know, circular. Uh, and in Africa, those working in reusing and recycling are really stuck in poverty because they are not closing the loop of circularity that will help them leapfrog out of poverty, addressing environmental degradation, and generate higher value for sustainable development for local economy and for national economy and beyond. And in, Africa, uh, in Benin, as in Africa, you can see from that point of view, uh, not only it's about urban development because Benin is a country of 11 million people and uh, urbanization is quite happening at a very high rate, close to 5% of the population. Uh, is moving to urban areas, and nowadays it is 45% of the population living in cities. And in that regard, urban waste are fast growing. Calculations are saying that it may triple uh, from now to 2050, as is the, the case for most of the sub saharan African countries. But then, keep in mind that 70% of the solid urban waste are just uh, dumped in the open and think about what it means for uh, health and what it means therefore for impact on population and beyond. But that's not the, the key point because recycling and bringing urban waste into circularity, you all know about that. I'm here to tell you about something that is very dear to my heart. I haven't heard that word since this morning. It is soil degradation. Soil is, degraded soil are the forgotten waste of humanity. And it is the one that we must bring into the loop of secularity if we want to address the climate conundrum, uh, if we really want to uh, make sure that by 2050 we feed uh, 
9 billion people in a sustainable way and also uh, make sure that this is happening in a way that will reduce environmental degradation. Look at what is up there. You see, the PowerPoint slide that I put up there in your uh, right side is the PowerPoint we designed to bring the cabinet ministers to understand what it means for Benin uh, land degradation. From, 20, from 2000 to 2010, this is what it has meant for Benin. In some areas, it's up to 50% of loss of productivity in the land, and it is also about more than 37% of population affected by land degradation between 2000 and 2010, meaning in one decade, 37% more people have been affected by land degradation. But when you bring all this to a minister or to a minister of economy, it doesn't help much. What you need to tell him is what it implies to address that and how it may bring this uh, uh, to help the nation to move towards growth in a sustainable way and take people out of poverty. And we take this to a, we organize a, 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 a workshop for ministers actually, showing them how landscape restoration could work how it could take people out of poverty, because most of the degraded land are the asset of the poor. And in Benin, when you map degraded land, they overlap with where people suffering from food insecurity and hunger live. So if you want to help them, help them improve the productivity of their land. So when you also consider where do Benin have a potential uh, growth for the future? It's in agriculture, in agribusiness and in tourism. And what are the risks for that growth? It is mainly about climate change. If you map those uh, things and you have ministers understand, therefore, how we change uh, business as usual. Of course, in Benin, everything is urgent. Everything is urgent, Don't, then ministers will say, well, what you say, we can't put more money here. It's not about more money. It's about better use of the resources that are available. It's about, for instance, understanding land or soil carrying capacity, where to grow what. And the example we gave to the ministers is this. For the time being, Benin is the fifth cashew nut producer in Africa. And the ambition of the government is to move to become the third. But cashew nut trees are suitable for soil restoration in the areas where uh, you know, growing cashew nut trees is uh, interesting. So making sure that we map the soil capacity and in, we make sure that where the land is degraded and it can still be restored, we make it available and accessible to farmers. And we help them, we phase out the perverse incentive and we bring into place and into play the incentive that will help for restoration. Then we will see that we can move from the fifth to become the third without encroaching on existing pristine ecosystem because in Benin, every year we have been growing our agricultural land at a pace of 50,000 hectares per land. This meant that from 2000 to 2010, 19% of the agroforestry landscape has been degraded. And now if you change that approach and you, you phase out perverse incentive and you make sure that landscape stakeholders and smallholder farmers understand soil carrying capacity and you help them do the right thing in making restoration, working for them, profitable for them, for profitable for business and profitable for consumption transformation patterns at national level, then the calculation says that we could bring this to be profitable for the economy of the nation up to 6.15% of the economy in socio-economical benefit. So when you say that, you are likely to attract the interest of the government and that's what has happened. Now the government has decided to have a national census of smallholder farmers, capacity and resources and mapping the 
the cutting capacity of, of their landscape and how they could therefore transition towards a restorative agricultural uh, uh, processing and what could be, it could mean to the overall national economy. So this is underway and we do hope that we will work as we speak about the circular economy to make sure that it is a restorative economy as well. That as we measure how the circular economy is profitable for the developing countries, that we will also measure to what extent it is a restorative economy. Thank you. Very interesting, and again, looking at different scales, but seeing the uh, business sense uh, in making progress on circularity. Our tour of the world continues uh, as we move across to Brazil now. Um, and this morning, we heard from Isabella Teixeira, co-chair of the UNEP International Resource Panel. A former hat was, uh, she happened to be the former Minister of Environment in Brazil. So maybe no one better placed than to offer a few insights on what is happening uh, in that extraordinary e uh, economy. So great to have you back on the stage. Thank you very much indeed. I'm back. Okay. <laughs> uh, forget this, okay? Please. Uh, okay, uh, yes, please. Uh, turn on the lights. I'm not used. This is just one example that we have in Brazil and considered cities. And uh, transport, it's very important, but it's not enough to illustrate our challenges. And I confess that I'm very, I'm very uh, uh, tired <laughs> because I have a 12 hour jet lag. So I need circular economy and resource efficient to, to talk now. But uh, it's very interesting because all the presentations uh, before uh, 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 my presentation uh, seems uh, like we have Brazil situations, different situations, because you're a huge country and uh, you are in a transition, it's an emerging economy, and Brazil plays important roles for global issues, not to only consider land use, as Luke mentioned, here before, but also consider industrial revolution and the cities, uh, lifestyles and welfare. And, uh, and I can give, for example, not only in transport, but in fashion industry in Brazil, that's so important to influence consumption and new behaviors for production and consumption is key for our economy, how we can increase circular economy and resource efficient in the fashion industry in Brazil. And we have really huge examples, uh, not only waste management, also how we have design, eco-design, and we are influencing the behavior of young people, how we can buy and uh, how we can use better our clothes and have a new expression, a new behavior expression that we are into the, this century, not in the last century. So we have a, a, a water management, we have different perspectives, but what I'd like to address here, because I don't have much time, and this clock is terrible, it's bad, 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 worse than my biological watch today, but, but uh, look. Um, I think that um, some important political message here considers circular economy and developing economies. As mentioned before, you have different stages of developing, and all the countries we are looking for development. It's this. And, uh, and the circular economy, uh, it's absolutely strategic to have a new understanding about resource use and how we can use this for economic growth and how we can decouple this for environmental impact. Second, it's very important here, private sector and um, society play, and also financial sector, play an innovative role to bring this into reality. I was here carefully looking at uh, the previous presentation, mainly from uh, uh, um, Area and also uh, from China. And the challenge is all the time, you mentioned private industry and private sector, it's like in the political world, you need to pray for non-converted people. Forget the converted people, okay? They're on board. We need to bring these players to make the difference. They, they will influence the public policy in our countries. And it's beyond government. We need the the push from society and from private sector and financial sector to make the difference. And circular economy is a clear example because this is economy. 
this must make sense, the economics make sense, uh, economic sense. And this will influence how we take decision to have shortcuts to deal with, to tackle, for example, infrastructure gaps that our society has. My country have really uh, another uh, important uh, uh, approach that is the rural development and cities development. You'll be around uh, the next uh, years to be 90% of our population that will be living in cities. So, and you have big cities, as everybody knows, but also small cities and medium cities. And you need to understand, and I give a good example, everybody here likes to discuss Amazonia uh, based on deforestation. You have more than 25 million people that live there in urban cities, <laughs> urban areas. It's very important how you can address uh, the demands for quality of life of these people that live there, consider circular economy, and how you can protect the forest. And don't forget that Brazil has a big challenge when you go to Amazonia. You need to discuss what Amazonia needs from Brazil, and what Brazil needs or wants from Amazonia, and what the international world wants from Amazonia protection and conservation. It's not only in Brazil. We have Indonesia, an important tropical forest, and how we manage this. And I'm discussing this here because if you want to raise ambition on climate change agenda, we need to use resource efficient and circular economy to convince the guys to move fast. If not, probably again, I'm not talking about mitigation only, I talk about adaptation agenda. And don't forget that the adaptation agenda is supposed on Paris Agreement to be in charge of national requirements on national countries not international support for this. And this is very important to tackle this and to go to manage better the adaptation agenda and also our risks and vulnerabilities. And again, if you go to mining industry, agriculture sector, oil and gas, and renewable energy, even we're talking about uh, resource efficiency and how we can have circular economy as an asset to manage this agenda in an innovative way. For a country like Brazil, it's very important also to highlight here that, uh, uh, in my opinion, we have a big challenge in our country, not only to, uh, to avoid uh, the, the, the shortcuts that we assume in the past, for example, how it, it is a good example of Brazil. Brazil, it's uh, 40 years ago, we imported food, 40 years ago. And now we are the most important players on food production and we beat the big one in 2030. This is a big revolution, okay? And uh, we need to discuss the next 40 years for agriculture in Brazil. It's not only low carbon agriculture, it's resource efficient agriculture. You need to manage water, you need to understand and to use circular economy to reduce or to minimize the gaps or the difference between rural environment and urban environment. And this is a big challenge for a country like Brazil because we have inequalities, we have different regions in my country. It's a huge country. But if we suppose that we stabilize our population around 2,500 people in 2050. And this is a huge, it's a really an asset for us how we can use this in a positive way. Again, resource efficient is not only an uh, environmental uh, uh, speech. This is a really developing agenda that you're looking for to bring this it on board to make the difference considered the public, cho the public choice that we, need, that we need there the next year. My final comment, because it's just a, a big picture in, in my country, we are discussing today uh, sustainable development goals and climate change. How we can bring these two uh, 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 worlds together? Again, Circular economy can make the difference, not only consider waste management in cities or transportation, like this example in Cidade de Curitiba, Curitiba City is a really good example of how you can manage public transportation in a big city, but it's not enough. Because we're discussing here new partners, new, new partners of transportation, for example. We are looking in my, in my society, we have bikes today as a good, a good uh, uh, alternative for transportation. And, uh, and it's not only how you can have electric vehicles, you're moving beyond this. And this is the huge debate that you need to understand how you can use better and have a better planning, land use planning in cities in, our, in rural areas. And again, circular economy can make sense for everybody how you can use resource efficiency as a key uh, uh, asset to be addressed. 
My last comment is that, uh, uh, indeed, what makes sense? We are looking for new welfare and lifestyle standards. And developing economies is crucial to bring into the agenda welfare okay, and lifestyle. And of course, as mentioned earlier, uh, we don't have, uh, if you're not able to change our trends of, of resource use, you don't have enough natural resource to manage, for example, the global agendas and the national ones. My country have really important uh, natural resource reserves and stocks, and this is crucial. We need to move from this vision of stocks to have a better use, and how, as Luke mentioned, manage better uh, soil degradation and also uh, uh, soil resource, how you can use this better in the world. For countries that are responsible for food security in the future, this is key. We have more than 100 million of hectares of degraded soil in Africa and in other important agriculture uh, developing economies. And you don't need to put pressure on forests. Indonesia knows this as Brazil also, okay? We need to, if you want to protect and you need to protect forests, we need to understand better what is the role of circular economy to bring this issue that is the worst use of natural resource and how we can restore this, how we can recycle this. This is a new political and economic speech when you talk about waste management. It's a new behavior when you talk about waste and also uh, uh, better natural resource use. So for my country and our experience shows that uh, it's very important that we can have this global uh, approach uh, linked directly to local priorities and how you can manage better local solutions. And this is key for rich countries. It's impossible for us to go into the big cities without being able to manage middle cities or small cities, for example, because people live there, even in Amazonia, okay? And we have to discuss challenge, urban challenges in the Amazonia region. It's a big, big, big and innovative uh, dispute that you have uh, considered different policy and investments. Don't forget that uh, uh, for developing economies, we need to address infrastructure gap, we need to address social inequalities, we need to understand the regional and sub-regional uh, challenges on development, and uh, as you mentioned, sir, you have different countries here, Asian countries, but if you go to Latin America, you have different, really different situations when the huge countries that must address solutions based on uh, development answers, concrete answers, and new standards for lifestyles and also for welfare. Uh, so for me, and consider my experience in my country, uh, we need to increase inclusion and resilience uh, through, through the introduction of this new technology, innovation, what really the, the new world is bringing for, to us, but don't forget that we need to highlight the values, the local values, and the cultures of different societies. Probably your experience in China will be very different than the experience that you have in Benin, or you have in Namibia, or you have in Brazil. But what developing economies we are looking for is how we can manage our future based on solutions. And we need to avoid the mistakes that also developed economies made in the past. Okay, so if you want to address resource efficiency in renewable energy, we need to understand uh, what happened, what is security, and how we can use this. Battery storage is very interesting, very strategic for us, but how we can access? What would be the price? What would be the conditions for technology innovation that you can access this to change our traditional way to use natural resource? And this is key because at least we are discussing economy. So I'd like uh, to only to highlight that a country like Brazil have different solutions. One minute, okay, please. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I have a jet lag of 12 hours. I'm complete excess. One minute, okay? And, uh, but only to remember that uh, you have diversity of problems, but you have a diversity of solutions. And what you can have in forum like this one is more than change experience. We need to understand how we can have shortcuts amongst uh, emerging economies and developing societies and only to discuss solutions and inequality. If you're not able to address inequality, be sure that it be not sustainable. Again, you have some islands with well, good uh, performance, but again, you have inequalities in our, in our country. It is, is unsustainable, be sure of this. So, 
you have the floor, Madam, at least, and I think that uh, I have to go to another uh, VIP conference. I don't know what <laughs> this, and I have this, this is plastic, you need to, re to recycle this, okay? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, I'm sorry. Thank you, Madam. <laughs> Um, very interesting speech that the, you know, the, the remarks suggest that the, even within one jurisdiction, uh, you know, the challenge for the circular economy differ, for instance, from the city to the, the rural areas. And also, the, uh, I'm very much impressed by the, the uh, you know, the, the, how the uh, resource efficiency issue is not only environmental agenda, but also the development agenda. So I, I think the, now they are like to invite the, another case study uh, uh, from the Indonesia. So they are like to invite the Mr. Noblizau Taha from the Indonesia. Uh, so you have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think the camera should sort focus uh, on this. This is uh, from the plastic waste packaging. This is a circular economy. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Nofrizal Tahar as Director of Solid Waste Management, Ministry of Environment and Forestry, Republic of Indonesia. In this opportunity, I would like to greet thanks to the Ministry of Environment Japan, who has invited Indonesian to join this valuable forum of World Circular Economic Forum. I would also thank to the organizing committee for the excellent cooperation for my participating in this forum. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as an archipelago country, Indonesia has registered in the amounts of 17,000 islands, which consists of 34 provinces and 515 cities and municipalities. The total population in Indonesia is about 253 million people with annual growth 1.2 persons. Solid waste production in Indonesia reached more than 65 million ton per year, and the composition shown that most waste are organic waste, 57 persons, and plastic waste is second highest, 16 persons. It is tend to be changed the composition from year 2000. 13 of organic production is about 60% to 57%. With this impacted to the increasing of the plastic waste production from 9% in year 1995 to 16% in year 2016. The plastic waste production is most higher in the big and metropolitan cities due to changing behavior and people's lifestyle. Waste paper is about 10% and metal 4% and etc. The government has doing intervention through shifting paradigm of waste to resources and circular economy of solid waste management by stipulating some regulation. Law number 18 year 2008 regarding solid waste management. Government regulation number 81 year 2012 and the new, the presidential decree number 97 year 2017 regarding national policy and strategy of solid waste management. Under the national and strategy, we set up the national target of solid waste management until year 2025, 
Solid waste are 100% well managed by 30% of waste reduction and 70% waste handling. It is challenging that to optimize of solid waste management by promoting solid waste as a renewable resources and the implementation of 3R concept to promote circular economy through, through the waste bank mechanism. This is original from Indonesia. Recycling center plan and also recognition of the informal sectors. The implementation of resource efficiency and circular economy concept has been started since year 2012 by promoting 3R. Principle through the waste bank, recycling center, and informal sectors to utilize solid waste as valuable material of renewable resources in industrial sectors that can minimize production costs and also to save non-renewable resources. Indeed, environmental conservation to keep the environment clean and health. The existing number of waste bank has reached 5,200 waste bank scattered in 34 provinces and 219 cities around Indonesia. With public participation in the West Bank is more than 185,000 customers. And also we have informal labors, labors about more than millions that working on solid waste. There are social, environmental, and economic benefit from circular economy. Finally, the government of Republic Indonesia has been released the regulation regarding fast track, fast track for the waste to energy under the presidential decree number 35 year 2018 in 12 cities in Indonesia. The enabling factor for the waste to energy in Indonesia first, waste to energy should be part of solid waste management implementation. So it should be in line with system of the segregation, collection, and transportation of waste. And finally, strengthen government central and local in form of operational and maintenance costs. Finally, please welcome to Indonesia. We make it real, the circular economy. Thank you for your effort your kind attention. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much indeed. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. What is the... I'm just looking... Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. From the plastic waste. That's... that's Flexible packaging. That's fantastic. You, ha you have a look at mine. Mine was... Um, my bag came from a conference uh, 15 years ago in Barcelona. Oh. And it's made of uh, re. That's right. And this is so. This is reused um, uh, Audi car safety belts, okay. and this is banners ben put Pablo. over the road in Barcelona, oh. all produced by a social enterprise. So the examples are there. So we we, make it the real circular we need to use them. That's right. That's right. <laughs> So, goodness me, we've been everywhere in the world. Not quite. We have one more example uh, for you. Where shall we go at the end of this afternoon? Let's go to Korea. Uh, so, I'm delighted from Seoul that uh, uh, Lee Young Ki, Director General of the Environment Resources Research Department of the National Institute of Environmental Research of Korea, is with us this afternoon. Our final a presentation on this whistle-stop tour around the globe. So, uh, Mr. Lee Young-ki, delighted to hear from you and hear some of the messages emerging from Korea. Thank you. I'm the last speaker and I'm given eight minutes. I'll finish it in time. Uh, uh, uh.
My name is Yong Gi Lee. I work for the National Institute of Environmental Research. And uh, uh, today I'm about to introduce to you the current status of the circular economy in Korea. Korean economy has grown more than 10% from the 1980s to 1990s, which also raised the volume of waste generation in an alarming rate. Public concern of waste generation in an alarming rate. Public concern against the waste matter has spontaneously rise, which led to the promulgation of the Waste Management Act. After waste disposal management has become general, the public concern headed to the recycling in the 1990s. To answer the public demand, the Resource Recycling Act has been enacted. By the middle of 2000, the general public noticed that uh, waste can be a valuable resource when reused, giving birth to the idea of resource circulation. Reflecting this idea, the recycling rate marked over 84% in 2015, and three years later, which is this year, the Framework Act on Resource Circulation was enacted, making the circular economy institutional. Despite of all this progress, there are still challenges up front. First of all, the annual waste generation has been gradually increasing during the past decade. Also, 9% nine, nine of waste produced by household and business is still being buried in landfill. And dreadfully, more than 50% of reusable waste is being incinerated or dumped in the landfill. It tells that the current waste separation system isn't doing well. It is summoning a new paradigm, a paradigm that enhances the efficiency in the use of resource. The paradigm is a circular economy. Let me strip down the framework plan for the resource circulation in Korea. This framework plan is Korea's yellow brick road to circular economy. Similar to the EU's package, it defines the decade length of a national strategy for each, uh, for each four steps of resource circulation, produce, consume, management, and recycle. Produce stage will focus on the redu reducing the use of raw material and designing the product to be resource circulation oriented. To undertake this objective, Korea government will introduce the resource effective management system for reducing resources and energy loss through the diagonies for all production process from the late next year. Consume stage will promote the reuse of reusable resource, making the consumers more eco-friendly. Recently, we made some good example that I want to bring it up today. Starting from June, the Korean government, under the mutual consent with industries, urges the use of disposal plastic in major cafe franchise such as Starbucks, according to Starbucks, according to the Resource Reduction and Recycle Encouragement Act, two months later, 92% of domestic cafe industries adopt reusable cups, and 80% of cafe users are using reusable cups. This is a good example of a public participation in waste reduction. Management system will focus on the efficiency of collection, separation of waste, and cooperation among involved bodies to make safe disposal convergences to a zero landfill. In the collection and separation step, the modern, modernization of the automatic recycling system will be adopted to minimize the generation of waste Residues. At the same time, 
optimized disposal measurement of waste will be prepared by forming a governance with local residents, NGOs, and expert groups. Also, GPS system will be added to waste collection transportation vehicles by tracking and managing waste treatment in near time. Finally, in recycle stage, it will aim to build a high quality infrastructure to encourage recycling of high value reusable waste. The advanced recycling system will be arranged for the potential waste, like waste batteries for electric vehicles, solar panel waste, also recycling system on plastic vehicle and electric electronic products will be upgraded. Through this frame, frame of plan, we want to reduce 20% of generation of waste until 2027 and uh, minimizing the final disposal rate from 9.1% to 3%. Also, we are expecting to draw up the circular utility rate to 82% enabling sustainable circular economy. This is all for today. And I hope I can bring you some good more example next time. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so there we have it. Uh, a number of case studies. Uh, fascinating, different yeah. seeing the different stages uh, of development and how the concept is being embraced uh, at different mm -hmm. levels. What we'd like to do, uh, as we are almost at the end of this uh, the afternoon, and uh, we're going about to go to a reception for some uh, relaxation and Japanese hospitality, mm -hmm. um, is I'd just like to uh, invite uh, one person, one final person to offer some com comments, and uh, Keith Alverson is director of uh, the UNEP IETC, that's the International Environmental Technology Center, the new director. So we're just going to have a conversation with Keith, if you are here, uh, just with Keith, just as we try and draw some of the strands together. Whilst he's coming up, maybe just for a moment, turn your gaze from the stage and just have a brief word with somebody next to you. What's, what's grabbing you? What are you learning from what you have heard uh, this afternoon. So just have a couple of minutes of thought and then we'll see uh, what uh, Keith has to offer us by way of insight. So just have a short conversation with your neighbour. So true. <laughs> Here's back. I shall curtail the buzz of conversation. So, Keith, great to have you with us. Goodness me, we have offered a kaleidoscope of different examples. First of all, it may just be interesting, just for those of us who don't know, the um, IETC, just, just give us the heads up of uh, where that sits in the great scheme of things. Sure. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm sure, actually, the conversations in the room are probably as interesting <laughs> as ours here, but Always the case. Uh, IETC, the International Environmental Technology Center, is based here in Osaka, Japan, uh, funded by Japan, and is part of the United Nations Environment Program. We focus on technological solutions mm -hmm. to environmental challenges with a, a, a real focus on waste management. So that's probably come up in, I think, all of the examples we've heard yeah, so far. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to mercilessly expo exploit the, uh, the wisdom, both of Yukari and also yourself, but I'm just wondering, perhaps initially, what, what key messages you draw from seeing how different uh, countries at different stages A, are embracing the concept of circularity and what that's meaning in terms of uh, support, interventions. What, what do you learn from, from what you've heard this afternoon? Yeah, uh, it was really a wealth of examples. Uh, I w the first thing I would say is uh, uh, challenge the notion of stages of development. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of uh, different countries presented and uh, maybe these countries are on some kind of spectrum towards a circular economy. But in fact, no country 
on the planet is an example of a circular economy. So this idea of a circular economy, in a way, it's an aspirational goal. It's a bit like the sustainable development goals. It's something that we can put out there, uh, but, it's, but we really have to think outside the box, outside of the constraints that all of our countries are in, in order to think about that circular economy. So then the question for every country, every city, every company is, well, what are those constraints? What is the box? Uh, is, it, is it money? Is it a financial constraint that's stopping us from getting to that point, that aspirational goal? Or is it technology or knowledge? Uh, what are the limiting constraints? And there's no specific answer there. I think all the countries have different limiting constraints. Uh, I, would, I would just say then, you know, in thinking about that, uh, that even, just to throw something, and I think nobody has mentioned so far, even if we did manage to get to the aspirational goal of a circular economy, and it was ticking, humming nicely, let's say right here in Yokohama, a nicely ticking circulating <laughs> circular economy, boom, earthquake, catastrophic event. That could be a natural event. It could be uh, an economic event. It could be a social event. But this is going to be a huge challenge for circularity. In one day, you can generate as much waste with an earthquake in a big city, as you can generate in 10 years of normal operations. And that's mixed waste, it's hazardous substances, mixed with building materials. So the, the kind of, uh, any kind of thinking about how we can achieve circularity has to include thinking about extreme events, about uh, perturbations to the system, about sudden changes, uh, and have contingency plans for those. Uh, on that sobering uh, thought, uh, I just wonder, Yukari, whether you, you draw any particular observations from, from what we've heard. Yeah, rather, the, uh, maybe I could ask mm. the keys, uh, you know, one question. Uh, you know, the, we, you mentioned that the, uh, you know, the, each country with a different, uh, you know, development stage have faced a specific challenge, maybe the finance and technological and technical. So, or on behalf of the UNEP or UN system, how you could contribute to the enhancing this, you know, achieving this aspirational goal, as you mentioned, that the circular economy. Yeah, so the role of the UN really is in helping uh, sharing lessons. Um, as I said, there is no stages of development. There is no easy conveyor belt mm. pathway to circular economy. But we have different lessons that, that countries can share with each other. And I, I see the UN as a platform, really, uh, a, an area where we can share lessons, both in terms of to bring uh, a, a word out of the climate change agenda, maladaptation. There's also probably maldevelopment, mm. you know, development that goes the wrong way towards circularity. In fact, I think Luke mentioned in his talk uh, many African countries uh, were, had almost perfect circular economies and then they developed and waste increased and the problems increased. So uh, I think the UN and, and our United Nations Environmental Assembly, which will be coming up uh, in March uh, of 2019, provide those sort of platforms where countries can come together, they can show mutual resolve to, uh, mm -hmm. to uh, address these issues through resolutions of mutual action. And they can provide a platform for discussion, for showing uh, some good scenario, some good uh, lessons learned, and also some, some maldevelopment uh, lessons that all of us can learn from and, and avoid in the future. And I just wonder, because there, if we look back in history, uh, we've seen where um, uh, a country looking for support, all the rest of it, suddenly people come in either with an inappropriate technology or, uh, or with some form of a contract or something which, which actually takes, uh, takes a country in, may, maybe in the direction it shouldn't be going. I'm just, and I, I was struck, I was at the uh, P4G, um, uh, so Partnerships for, for Growth Conference in, uh, uh, in Copenhagen uh, at the end of last week, and that came out of the Agenda 2030 uh, activities, and, and you were seeing a real new relationship between uh, different countries and businesses trying to forge a more responsive, respectful way of development. I just wonder, is there a new dawn where we're actually finding that these collaborations and partnerships are built upon the value and the needs of the country? Or are we still in a, a risky world where there seems to be an opportunity to, 
to make money to sell a technology or whatever that's inappropriate? Do we still need to be vigilant, or have we moved into a, a new phase of respectful harmony? Uh, I think we still need to be vigilant. <laughs> we, we certainly have uh, this aspirational goal that we're headed towards, but the bottom line is companies still want to make profit, and countries still want to raise their GDP. And they have this index of growth, which is gross domestic product. Uh, and until we get beyond that, until we find a way to measure uh, circularity in our economy, to monitor our, our progress towards this goal, which is different from just GDP as a sort of a flawed measure of income, not of wealth, yeah. Uh, then we'll still be sort of mucking about yeah. in, in a transition towards circularity. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it really behooves us to, to measure uh, how, to think about how we can measure progress towards this circular economy. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wonder one final thought. Cities. Um, uh, so many events and conferences I'm involved in, the conversation is around the city is the great... Um, opportunity ground, uh, ground where we, we have to realize uh, the concept of sustainability in, in reality, otherwise these cities will be entirely um, dysfunctional. Um, and we're seeing many huge cities with enormous uh, challenges. I'm, I'm just wondering whether when you look at the whole growth of cities, uh, whether you're seeing that as the as the opportunity, as the test bed for circularity, or whether sometimes I look at cities and just feel so daunted, uh, particularly with some of these mega uh, cities, that, that what we're actually seeing is uncircularity in all its worst forms, <laughs> and good luck to us moving forward. No, no, that sounds a little too pessimistic. <laughs> I, would say, I would say that uh, urbanization is, is a real demographic shift, and there are Demographic changes are impacting different countries in different ways. Here in Japan, uh, you know, one of the major challenges is finding a way to deal with a shrinking population, yeah. while at the same time, Tokyo is growing. Yeah. Uh, many countries are showing great uh, increases in urbanization, and I think there are both. Ch there are certainly challenges associated with urbanization. Huge urban slums in much of the develop developing world are an incredible challenge, but there are also opportunities. Uh, a lot of the challenges of circularity will be easier because people are living together in an urban environment and able to uh, interact and uh, deliver um, some service, some products and services more efficiently. Uh, the transport question, which uh, we saw from Brazil, is more yeah. more efficient in, if you can develop uh, urban areas uh, effectively. Mm -hmm. So I think it's both a, yes, it's a challenge. We can't shy away from the fact that all these mega cities all over the globe are an, an enormous challenge for a circular economy. But also I think it's an opportunity, an opportunity to think about different development pathways and different paradigms for, for circularity in, in cities. Interesting. Uh, and I just want to, uh, Yukari, I'm going to get you to put your environmental uh, expert hat on, but just as you see, um, the stories coming from a whole set of different economies. Is there any sort of uh, insight or thought you may just want to share with us, um, particularly also because you're involved in quite a lot of international uh, environmental uh, law and guidance, etc.? Yeah, I think much already mentioned by the keys, but uh, I could maybe highlight a two point. I think some, uh, you know, the uh, speaker already mentioned that and how to raise the finance, I mean, scale and pace. So the, I think that might be, uh, we need a, some kind of collaboration with the financial institution, and uh, that is one point. And the second is, also you mentioned, I mean, Keith mentioned, that how to, you know, to make a policy put in place, or how to make a regulatory framework to, to promote a circular economy. That is, I think, very important point to exchange experience and the learned lessons. Mm. Wonderful. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we hope that uh, our whistle-stop tour around the globe has raised some thoughts, some ideas, some issues. There's a book to be downloaded, <laughs> which will give us some significant uh, insights and uh, evidence. Um, uh, but we hope this, again, has raised a, a range of thoughts 
and issues. There seems to be this as a landscape of opportunity. The one thing I draw from it is no one is saying circular economy, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure that's a great concept. It just makes so much sense. We're all just grasping at different bits of understanding. Uh, and I sometimes wonder whether this is the most uncomfortable period <laughs> that we're going to be living through mm. when we begin to have the insight and the knowledge and yet we have got a long journey to go to be converting that into, in, into change. So it sometimes feels a bit strange in the stomach, mm. uh, but perhaps that's the piece of history yeah, yeah. that we're living through. Um, but for now, could we say a huge thank you to our case study presenters and also to Keith. Thank you very much thank indeed. You. Thank you. We'll just thank you. Great. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. So I think we're, I think it's high time we relaxed and yep. had some conversation lubricated by something or other. Tell us what's going on, Yukari. Yeah, I have very important practical information to the audience. The first is that our evening reception will be start, will start at 6.15, I think it's already in 10 minutes. <laughs> so the, you know that the, the, it, it is held in the Tokyo Bay Hotel. I think you know the hotel, you know, on the way to the Minato Mirai Station. So I think you cannot miss it. <laughs> but the, the, please remind you, uh, that, uh, I'd like to remind you that the, you need this ID badge for the entrance ticket so that you cannot forget it. So that's a very important thing. And the second information, uh, practical information, is that still the headset. Please uh, take your headset to the exit so that the, please take your headset to the staff waiting for at the exit. So that is very important resources. And two more bits of information by way of an added incentive. Uh, there is drink and there is food aplenty. <laughs> so do come and join us there and we may have a surprise or two with a Japanese twist. Yes. So this is a reception <laughs> not to be missed. Yes. And then afterwards you can disappear into the wonderful night oh, air yeah. of Yokohama. For now, thank you all for your attendance. We'll see you down thank the road you. in just a few moments. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Yeah. <sighs>